Back in the year 2000 when I was 11, my mother, my brother, and myself flew from West London to Perth, Australia to spend five straight weeks for my uncle's wedding. My uncle's place was practically a palace. He lived in a gated community with several security guards who patrolled the area and had one of those pin drop sensitive alarm systems. On the fourth day of our visit, all the adults went out for a party. My brother James, who was 13, and myself were going to be left all alone in my uncle's place for a while. But given that it was as secure as Fort Knox, no one was very concerned about us being on our own. Our mother promised to be back by 1 a.m. and left us her mobile number. They set the alarm and then left. And afterwards, James and I wandered around the house in awe, feeling like we were in a museum. Every door and window we found was closed and locked. Eventually, we went back into the living room and began to watch a movie. We had the volume pretty high because we wanted to take advantage of my uncle's surround sound. About 30 minutes in, James paused the movie and tilted his head sideways as if he was listening to something. After a few seconds, he shrugged and resumed the movie. Less than five minutes after that, he paused again and looked towards the foyer. James and I were in the living room, and the wall that separated us from the foyer had this rectangular decorative opening with cast iron bars inside it. Beyond the opening was just darkness, because there wasn't any lights in front of the house. I asked what he was doing, and he quickly shushed me. We sat in silence for a few moments, and then he slowly seemed to relax and settle back into his seat and resumed the movie. About 15 minutes later is when I heard it. There was footsteps coming from the front of the house. It sounded like heavy boots on marble. And for us to be able to hear it over the surround sound meant whoever was there were not trying to be quiet. Surprisingly, neither of us freaked out. We didn't even pause the movie again. My brother just picked up the landline and called my mom's number while we both stared into the dark foyer, waiting for someone to peek their head around the decorative window and peer in at us. My brother had to call a few times before my mom finally answered. He stated much more calmly than I would have managed that he was sure that someone was in the house with us. My mother instructed him to hit the panic button on the security system and hide in one of the ground floor bedrooms and stated that she was on her way. I remember James and I looking at each other in apprehension. The panic alarm button was in the closet in the foyer, and that was where we had last heard the footsteps. I cautiously stood up, and feeling like I was detached from my own body, like it was a dream, I carefully wandered over to the hallway that led into the foyer. I didn't take another step when I noticed the motion sensor in the upper corner of the room. My uncle had these motion sensors in every room that would trip the alarm when no one was home. When we were there, the motion sensors were still on, but didn't set off the alarm. They did, however, flash red when they detected movement in the area. From my position peeking into the foyer, I saw the light flashing red. I was too far away for it to be sensing me. Someone was in the foyer, and they were moving around. I backed up and James immediately grabbed my hand. He must have seen the look on my face. He led me into the kitchen. Being the scared kids we were, our first instinct was to hide in the pantry. But we were only there for a minute or so because we realized how stupid it was to try and hide. We needed to get out of that house. We left the pantry and grabbed two knives from the knife block. Because what better way to make the situation even worse by running in a panic out the back door into darkness while clutching massive knives. As soon as we opened the door in the kitchen, the alarm started going off. I glanced back towards the decorative window and caught the glimpse of a man in a blue shirt looking through it. James and I sprinted around the side of the house. Without bothering to try and unlock the gate, James told me to slide my knife under the gate. He did the same and we both jumped over the gate and ran across the street. I was half convinced that the man would be right behind us, trying to catch us, but I didn't see him again. In fact, we didn't see anything else from inside the house until security arrived about a half a minute later. 
By then, we were sitting on the curb on the opposite side of the street. We heard a thudding noise from the second floor of the house. The security guard stood with us, and the police arrived a few minutes later. Three of them ran inside using the key the security guard provided, and they swept the house. Our mother arrived and held us tight until the police had the alarm shut off and exited the house. They claimed that no one was in the house, but the master bedroom on the second floor had been completely ransacked. Furniture was tossed across the room, which obviously hadn't been like that earlier. When James and I were wandering the house before all this, that bedroom had been in perfect shape. When my uncle arrived, he did a walkthrough of the house and shifted through the mess in his bedroom, but concluded that there was nothing missing. James and I were terrified when we heard from the police that there was no way the man could have gained entry while the alarm was on, and it was much more likely that he was in the house laying low until after the adults left. Since the intruder never came around our side of the house, they concluded he must have ran out back, jumped the stone wall, and escaped by running on foot down the freeway. One thing that has never sat right with me after all these years was that if the guy had been there to rob the place, he could have easily overpowered James and I while we were on the couch, or could have chased us down while we were running. I mean, he had to have known that we were there when he came out of his hiding place. The surround sound from the movie was blaring. He obviously didn't want to be seen by us, but also didn't want to hurt us. That made me suspect over the years that he may have been someone that we knew. Though I didn't recognize him based on the glimpse I caught of him. I'm also not convinced that my uncle was telling the truth when he said that nothing was missing. Maybe my uncle knew who the man was the whole time, but didn't want to turn him in. That's just a theory. But otherwise, I have no idea why a complete stranger would lay low in a house, remain hidden from us, not chase us when he saw us, and then ransack the bedroom before running away without stealing anything. Apologies in advance if I mispronounce any of the names in this next story. In February of 2003, I was renting out a room in a high-rise building in Daegu, South Korea. I was awoken just after 10 a.m. from the sound of wailing sirens. I looked out my window to see smoke billowing from the entrance of the Jungungno station. It was not a minuscule amount of smoke. It was like someone had lit the contents of a trash can on fire. There was a solid wall of smoke escaping from the underground chamber so thick, it was as if a volcano had erupted. After watching the street below turn into a parking lot of emergency vehicles, the alarm in my building went off, ordering us to evacuate. I exited the building, but I had no idea where to go. The smoke was so incredibly thick, and every direction was packed with people trying to get away on foot. I ducked back into the building and crouched in the entryway, keeping my face low to the ground and breathing the fresh air being pumped through the air conditioning vents. I stayed there for a good few hours, unwilling to venture out into the street and risk being trampled or suffocated. Yet I was too afraid to move deeper into the building in case it caught fire. I had no idea what was going on. I suspected a bomb had gone off. Without access to a phone, all I could do was wait, a thousand questions running through my head, with the hope that this nightmare would end. The smoke eventually cleared, but when it did, the screaming outside only intensified. I wandered out into the street in a daze, firefighters with oxygen masks on, frantically gesturing at each other, and now I had washed up upon the shores of Pompeii, directly after the eruption, and I just knew that I would never look at my life the same way again. It wasn't until nearly a week later that I learned the full story. A 56-year-old unemployed man named Kim Dae Han had boarded a train at Daegu Station earlier that morning with the intent to set the train on fire and burn the passengers inside alive. Han suffered from depression as a result of a stroke he had two years prior, which had left him partially paralyzed. He later told police he wished he had taken his own life but in a manner that he would take hundreds with him so that his pain would be remembered. He was spotted on camera carrying a duffel bag into the train station 
which contained cartons of flammable liquid. Once the train was in motion, he opened the bag and began pouring the liquid out. When other passengers saw him fiddling with his lighter, they rushed him in an attempt to stop him, which ultimately failed. Fire erupted in the train car. When the doors opened at the next station, Han and several other passengers managed to escape. Some were still on fire. Once the train stopped, the fire quickly began to spread across all six cars. There was so much smoke down in the platform that none of the cameras could see what exactly was happening. Another train heading in the opposite direction towards the platform was warned to proceed with caution, but was not instructed to stop. Upon arriving at the Jungungno station, the train came to a halt right next to the burning subway cars. The conductor was not sure what to do. The power failed at the station after a minute, which stopped the train from leaving, and while the conductor frantically tried to call for help over his radio, he eventually panicked and abandoned the train, leaving the passengers trapped inside. There were no fire extinguishers on board, and there was no water sprinklers on the subway platforms, and the smoke was too thick for the emergency responders to reach the trains for several hours. It was still early morning rush hour. Over 190 people, men, women, and children, all died. Kim Dae Han was eventually found later in the hospital, where he was being treated for his burns. On August 5th of 2003, he was sentenced to life in prison, where he died just over a year later on August 31st, 2004. The conductor of the second train was arrested for criminal negligence, as were six other members of the Metropolitan Subway Corporation. And that's my story of how I was practically on top of one of the worst mass murders in history. I left the city soon after, and have since tried to cherish every day as another gift, abundant with new possibilities. Two years ago, I was working at a very small coffee stand about 30 minutes outside of Seattle. I had been working as a barista for seven years by that point, and I had never been confronted with a situation that challenged my feeling of security while working alone. Unfortunately, that was about to change. On Thursday, November 7th, my birthday, at 6.45pm, I was starting to close the stand like normal. It was very rare that I would have customers come through the stand past 630 and because of this, I felt myself jump slightly when I looked up from the espresso machine I was cleaning to see a man standing behind the glass of the closed window. Adding to my alarm was the fact that he made no noise whatsoever and made no attempt to grab my attention once he got there. Instead, he stood behind the window in complete silence, his mouth awkwardly fixed into an unnatural-looking smile. At first, I wasn't even sure if he was a customer at all, considering the idea that he may have been part of a large group of transients and homeless people that were known to reside in that area, who would occasionally come up to the stand and ask for free coffee or water. For safety reasons, I typically refrain from serving walk-up customers after dusk, but because I had made eye contact with him, the rules of good customer service required that I at least acknowledge the fact that he was there. So, reluctantly, I decided to serve him. He introduced himself as Ivan. He looked to be around my age, seemed reasonably well kept in the sense his clothing and overall appearance looked clean, and despite a slight Eastern European accent, his English was very good. His eyes, however, were utterly unnerving. His gaze made my stomach feel uneasy. Immediately, my intuition was alarming me that something about this individual was very wrong. Every red flag possible was beginning to show in my mind. I could not shake the deep, almost overwhelming sense of darkness that I felt coming from this person. There was an evil in him that I could not ignore. I would soon find out exactly why I was feeling this way. After greeting him as politely as I could manage, despite my growing hesitations, I began preparing my machine to make him a drink. However, he didn't seem to know what he wanted to order and I asked him twice what I could get started for him, before I silently recognized the fact that he was likely not here for the coffee. Eventually, he abandoned ordering altogether, and instead directed our interaction towards small talk. He asked me where I was from, and how long I had been working at the stand. 
I answered each of his questions with short, abrupt answers. Hoping that my tone and clear lack of engagement would convey the fact that I wasn't interested in continuing this conversation, since he was not a paying customer, and because I was about to close. After a long pause, he asks, So do you have boyfriend? Annoyed, I replied curtly, No. At this point, I was ready to end our interaction, so I told him that I needed to finish closing up so I could go home. Upon hearing this, he walked away from the window and mentioned that he was looking forward to seeing me again very soon. After a minute or so passed, he was out of sight, but the creepy aura lingered. My gut told me that he wasn't far away. I just knew that he was watching me from somewhere beyond my line of vision. Cautiously, I closed up the stand, locked the doors and windows, and walked to my car and drove home. By the following day, I had forgotten all about the encounter and went to work as usual. 7pm rolls around once again, and I'm just about to end my shift and close the stand. I'm nearly finished when I catch a glimpse of something. I turn my head towards the opposite side of the stand, and there, in full view of both me and the security cameras, stood the guy from yesterday. My stomach sank, and I was immediately very aware of how cold it was inside of that stand. He smiled at me with a predatory-like grin, waved, and then proceeded to pull open the closed window in front of him. Even though he didn't present himself aggressively, there was something incredibly threatening about him choosing to do that. He left me feeling hopelessly unsafe in that moment. I cleared my throat and told him as firmly as possible that I was off the clock and I wouldn't be able to make anything for him as my machine has already been cleaned and my register was closed out for the day. He widened his smile and replied, It's okay. I didn't come here for the coffee. I came here for you. Upon hearing this, I noticed a shift in the energy building between us. The fear that I had previously been overcome with had now made a sudden and jolting transition into a redlining level of irritation. I don't care what you came here for. I told him as sternly as I could manage. It's going to have to wait till tomorrow because... I am fucking closed. His smile disappeared. His eyes became even more focused on me, and his gaze intensified. Then I see you tomorrow, he said in a way that felt less like a statement and more like a threat. I swallowed hard, and once he was out of sight, I rushed to the window and slammed it shut, throwing the lock into place. Again, Despite not being able to visually confirm his presence, I knew that he was still there, and I could feel his eyes fixated on me. I left the stand quickly and got into my car and drove home. This time, however, he remained heavily on my mind for the rest of the night, robbing me entirely of any sleep at all. The following morning was a Saturday, so as per usual, I got up insanely early for work at 5 a.m., I arrived at the stand 10 minutes to 5, and for the first few hours of my shift, everything was as it would normally be. 8.30 rolls around. As I was admiring the weather outside, I noticed a familiar truck approaching. As it neared closer, I recognized it as my ex-boyfriend, Jonathan. I found this exceptionally odd, as he and I were currently not on very friendly terms due to his cheating that ended our relationship about six months earlier. He pulled up slowly to the edge of the open window, and I asked him skeptically what he was doing here. I'm sure I'm probably not someone that you were wanting to see today, but I just wanted to come by and wish you a happy belated birthday, and to see how you were doing. Just as I was about to half-heartedly thank him for the birthday wishes, I noticed someone about a hundred yards away, approaching the stand on foot. It was Ivan. I whispered quickly to Jonathan that I needed him to stay here with me, even if another customer pulled in for service, until the guy who had just walked up was gone. I could tell he was able to register the fear in my eyes, and he agreed to stay. I brought as much focus into my demeanor as I could manage, and turned my face to the window on the opposite side of the stand, just as Ivan approached it. I walked slowly over to him and noticed right away that he had been crying. His eyes were bloodshot, 
A few tears streaked slowly down his cheeks. Disregarding his obvious emotional state, I informed him that he needed to leave, as I was not going to serve him. Before my statement reached its conclusion, however, he cut off my words abruptly. I don't need this anymore. You can have it. As he said this, he threw his Russian passport down on the counter in front of me. Puzzled, I picked it up. With a mix of both caution and disinterest, and I asked him why he was no longer going to need it. I just won't. I allowed his words to hang between us, while I attempted to make sense in my mind of what a gesture like this might have meant. Before I felt a strong bite of dread inside my chest, the fear crept slowly into my throat before finally escaping past my lips in an audible gasp, bringing Ivan the confirmation he had been hoping for once I understood what was about to happen here. No guest from a foreign country would be willing to discard or abandon their passport unless they intended to see the completion of an act of absolute finality. He wasn't planning on returning to Russia. In an effort to sever the non-verbal conversation taking place, I glanced over my shoulder to Jonathan, who now had a what-the-fuck-was-going-on look on his face. In that instant, he recognized the desperate, pleading fear in my eyes. This caused his own expression to quickly change to one of panicked urgency, as he attempted to understand what had just taken place between this stranger and myself. As I turned back to Ivan, his tears were now replaced with a look of what I can only describe as complete and utter insanity. This is the point where the dynamics of our interaction shifted indefinitely. God came to me last night in my dreams. He told me that you would be my wife. You are my wife. You are mine. A sickening, sadistic smile curled the corners of his mouth in such a way it was almost physically painful to witness. My heart began throwing itself violently against the side of my chest as adrenaline surged through my system. You are my wife, and now you come with me. Right now. At this, he planted his hands firmly onto the ledge of the window and began to lift himself onto it. Realizing now that he was attempting to crawl through the window into the stand, I practically threw myself across the small distance between he and I and quickly slammed the window shut, locking it. He pushed his weight back down off the edge, paused, and then proceeded to give me a look that made me truly understand the meaning of having one's blood run cold. I felt the inside of me begin to quiver in a way that I had never felt before, an anxious vibration that was working its way throughout my entire body. This was not over yet. I understood that much. At this, Ivan offered me a quick wink and began to move with obvious purpose toward the back of the stand. Soon, I could hear the faint but distinguishing beeping of the buttons being punched on the keypad that secured the lock on the back door. Ivan was trying to get through the only actual entrance to the stand. In my mind, I knew that there was no way he would ever manage to guess a four-number code and dismissed any arising concern that he would manage to gain entry. Not going to be that easy, I said under my breath though I was unsure if I truly believed that. The dread that followed at what I heard next is something that I will never forget, as I heard the fateful sounds of the keypad indicating a successful entry code, followed by the loud and heavy thud of the steel deadbolt retreating quickly back into the door. All I could see was the door in front of me. Nothing else. It was as if there was a glaring spotlight illuminating that door. All else around me fell into darkness, Time felt as if it had stopped. I no longer had a sense of it, or of the space around me. As the door began to slowly push open from the outside, I could hear an almost deafening scream resonate powerfully through the walls of the stand, expelled slowly by the force of fear. I stood there completely paralyzed and bared witness to the largest knife I had ever seen enter through the opening of the door, followed by Ivan's hand firmly gripped around it. It was only then that I realized that the scream I was hearing was my own. As Ivan passed the remainder of his body through the opening of the back door and into the stand, 
Before I continue any further, let me just say, until you personally experience a situation that demands you to access your fight or flight response, you have no idea what that response is going to ultimately be. The type of fear that's required to trigger this defense mechanism is more than most people ever realize. How you will react to it will be involuntary. I recognize that simple fact. Regardless of whatever this guy had planned for me, I intended to survive it. But not just simply survive, but I intended to execute a lesson this guy clearly needed to learn. Never underestimate someone's capability to persevere, or the fight that drives them. I suddenly remembered that Jonathan was still in his truck on the other side of the stand. I ran to the window and screamed desperately through the glass. Jonathan, he's got a fucking knife. Jonathan's eyes grew huge, and he threw open his driver's side door and flew from his truck towards the back of the building. Then, in the furthest corner of my vision, I caught the sight of a dark, looming presence enter into the space of the small interior of the stand. Ivan was now standing no further than ten feet from me. A feeling of dread overtook every inch of the small building and made the air so heavy around me that breathing started to become difficult. It felt thick and toxic in my lungs. It nearly caused me to choke. As my struggle to breathe increased, Ivan began to close the few feet of space still between us by taking slow, taunting steps in my direction. His knife was gripped firmly in his hand as it rested at his side. He spoke softly through the visual violence. You are my wife. Ivan ultimately managed to take a total of three steps towards me, before I saw an arm being thrown around his neck from behind. As I stood there in a state of paralysis due to the fear, I watched as Jonathan pulled Ivan back by the neck with so much force, his feet flew from beneath him. Suddenly both Ivan and Jonathan were on the ground right outside the door, with Jonathan securing Ivan in a headlock that proved impossible for him to break away from. Jonathan yelled strict instructions for Ivan not to move, or he would quote, choke the fucking life out of him. Surprisingly, Ivan remained completely still, never once making any signs of resistance. Jonathan kicked the knife away from his reach and told me to pick it up and secure it until the cops arrived. It felt like hours before the cops arrived. It took six cops to force Ivan into the cruiser. The whole time he kept shouting that God had sent him, and he had simply come to collect what was his. There's always a reason. <laughs>